right. Hi, everyone. This is Photography for Beginners. If you're joining us again, that was a quick test we did earlier. But uh, I'm Curtis Stewart, and we're going to go through all of this together here. Uh, so first off, let's get this slide deck going. Uh, this stream will be posted online on my channel after we're done. So if you get caught up or you can't watch the whole thing all the way through, you're more than welcome to kind of like pause, save it for later, and watch the rest. Uh, I didn't like taking notes as a student or kind of keeping up with the instructor. So I think that's a really nice thing about streaming live on YouTube is afterward people can rewind and scrub all the way through as needed. Uh, what are we covering tonight? Uh, a little bit about me and my hopes for this class. Uh, we're going to talk through a little bit of camera and photography terminology. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, my camera here and all the things I wish I knew when I picked it up for the first time. And then finally, if the audience has any questions, I'll be around to answer those. Uh, so me, I <laughs> whenever I show up in a meeting, people always say, you're very tall in person. It doesn't really come across when you're doing online classes. So uh, on the left here, this is a portrait taken of me by Marianne Lutenberger, who's a photographer over in Australia when she's in Vancouver. And on the right is me being very serious with my students when a model didn't show up for a shoot, so I needed to stand in to be a model. I think the creative direction for this was act like a velociraptor. So I'm pretty sure I nailed that one. Uh, I do have a site where all my work is hosted. The link is in the description below. It's curtisstewart.com. Uh, Curtis with a K because my grandfather's name was Kurt and he's German, so that's where that comes from. Uh, I've been a photographer since 2007. I took a full-time photography program and did that for about two years until graduating, including all sorts of technical classes and a practicum and just really kind of sticking my head in the language of photography for two years. Uh, but after graduating, I knew I wanted to come back and teach. It took me a little while to get to that place because obviously you don't hire a graduate straight out of the program and uh, you want them to have some industry chops first and also be a little bit older than a college grad to teach people older than the college grad. Uh, so I actually started teaching right around 2011. I've taught all sorts of things from Lightroom workflow, Photoshop, basic digital photography, uh, 3D animation. Uh, I really like to teach and find a great way to explain things to people. I think it's a teacher's job to find the right way to explain things. It's not just one way that people should understand things. I know some teachers get really stuck in like, this is the only way people should figure it out, but I'm interested to see how we can kind of interact and figure out a way to arrive at a way that makes sense to everybody here. I know we can't make everybody happy, but I will do my best. Uh, here's some of my work. So this is when I was on a trip into New York and uh, this is right when they have the 9-11 memorial so they light up the sky with these two big twin towers of lights uh, you can do this with the camera you have right now so this is just a really stable place to put the tripod on and then a long exposure so maybe 10 or 15 seconds and that what allows for that nice painterly effect in the sky and also underneath that like nice flowy painter effect to the water while all the buildings stay completely static and sharp uh, over here is another architecture piece. So they were updating two hospitals in the interior of British Columbia, and I was flying out there kind of every six to nine months to do site updates, and this is kind of the final product of all the work they'd put in over the, like, three-plus years of the project. Uh, this is the kind of photo that gets used in awards magazines and when they submit for recognition for, like, lead certifications and things like that. Uh, this is right after the Olympics left Vancouver. So they'd redone all the floors in the Olympic Village, and... Uh, I went in and shot, this is I think about 110, 120 frames in Photoshop, and then stitched them all together to give it this kind of fisheye effect. Uh, you couldn't do this with a lens, so don't like try and attempt this and make yourself feel bad that you can't do it, but uh, this is what some Photoshop skills can give you if you're looking for a, kind of a different perspective to show your clients or just for your own creative projects. Uh, I also just like walking around and talking with my clients. I like things that either I can have a conversation with, like people, or things that I have complete control over, like buildings. Uh, this takes kids and pets out of the equation pretty quickly. I usually pass those on to my friends that are a little better at that, those genres. Uh, I like to kind of explore neighborhoods and kind of troubleshoot weird lighting situations. Uh, so this is also when I was over in New York and just walking around with a fashion designer trying to figure out some additional images we could get for their press kit as they were going on a larger tour and getting more recognition. Uh, headshots is a big name of the game. So I get to meet a lot of cool people throughout all this and get to know a little bit more about their lives. Uh, on the left, we have a poet who is just looking for a little bit of an update for their portfolio page. We just took a nice little kind of elementary school field, got some backlight there, nice little portrait. Uh, and on the right, this was just at a conference I was covering. This gentleman came up and asked if he, I could do a new quick headshot for him. We found a nice simple boardroom, nice neutral background there of the wood. 
and just banged off a nice quick portrait he can have for LinkedIn for the future when he's representing himself online. Uh, I also do some event coverage. So I've been working in school in a lot of like club environments or bars, and that gave me a lot of kind of photojournalism chops. But working the bar and club scene isn't the most lucrative uh, pursuit for a photographer. It was really fun at the time, and I really enjoyed all the connections I made. Uh, but I really transitioned that more into commercial event photography. So any kind of corporate events, this is a staff party that was being held here in Vancouver. And I get to show up to these parties and kind of just hide behind my camera to a degree uh, and just experience things that I would never get access to or get invited to because again it's their staff friends and family that were invited and I get to see all these nice events happen. Uh, this is probably the image I'm most proud of because this was the first thing I created after my photography program that was exactly what I had in my head. Uh, so I had a friend who was a triathlete and uh, he needed some new photos to kind of update and seek out more sponsors and also document what he does. Uh, so we just took a kind of 200 meter section of highway and I must have had him go back and forth about a hundred times we got a whole bunch of gear and we were rigging cameras off bikes and trying to like not damage my cameras and also not damage his very expensive bikes uh, but then we walked away with an image like this and I'm still so proud of this I still include it on my kind of like intro slides because it was the first moment where I had something in my head I was able to use all the technical skills from school and my understanding and execute something that's like 99% what I had envisioned so super satisfying still something I'm very proud of uh, so what's this class you're probably wondering you know who I am now and you're wondering what's gonna happen with this class well this is a new platform for me to teach on typically I've done in-person teaching at like the typical college or trade school environment for the last five or six years uh, I did online through the pandemic as we all kind of shifted to a mode that made everybody safe to be able to be instructed and not have to worry about going to campus and all the different restrictions around that uh, so YouTube is kind of just the next evolution of that I'm kind of curious what will happen with the whole live stream element and not exactly being able to read the audience something I do really well that is maybe not coming across right now is understanding when people do or don't understand something I'm explaining so as I'm talking to this camera here on top of my monitor the camera's just kind of like quietly sitting there nodding and being like yep 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 Curtis I hear that uh, so I don't have people with those like quizzical looks in their face in the classroom so I'm gonna rely a little heavily on the chat and also the comments people leave on videos to make sure I'm addressing all the questions and make sure everybody understands what they're walking away with uh, my hope with this class is to come online once a week and kind of progress the next set of skills moving on and obviously leave that up as a playlist so people can kind of follow along if they join the community a little further down the road. But that's what I'd like to build is these little digestible chunks. You can take a little bit of photography information, build on the skills you have or that you're trying to gain, and then become a better photographer over time without having to invest like three to four hours a week of commuting to the class, showing up in person, taking that knowledge and... Uh, working on those projects. In all of this, I hope to embrace the glitches. I've got a whole bunch of new software that I'm trying out. I'm streaming this through OBS and going and streaming this live through YouTube. I'm sure something's gonna go horribly wrong. My microphone's gonna cut out. My webcam's gonna go wonky. Some slide deck isn't gonna read properly. Uh, and I'm doing this all live. So <laughs> I basically spent the afternoon being like, oh God, oh God, what have I signed myself up for? Uh, but I think we're just going to see what the experience is like to start this off and you get to see what it's like for someone to start their kind of like YouTube approach and that's going to come with some mistakes. So for me, I'm just kind of giving myself this slide to be off the hook for like something's going to screw up. I accept that and we'll kind of work through it whenever that problem arises. Uh, if you have questions, like please do fire away in the chat. Uh, I've got it up here. I know initially we're not going to have a huge following, but you won't be interrupting or anything. I think it's really important to address questions as they come up. Uh, there's kind of that rule instructors have if one person in the classroom has a question probably 10 other people have that same question so there are no stupid questions here just things we're trying to clarify because I guarantee you I'm the type of student that asks first I sit in the front row I put my hand up immediately if I don't understand something uh, because I've been a student for a very long period of time just as long as I've been an instructor I want to suck out all the knowledge from an instructor and really understand and walk away with the understanding of that concept, topic, approach, and really understand why it's done that way, who they talk to about that, where they learn that from, how come they don't do it this way, what about this other piece of gear, how come they're not using that? All those little elements that happens in the back of a creative's mind, but really takes asking good questions to be pulled to the forefront. Uh, there's probably two types of people that are watching this right now. The people that are just doing photography for fun, they want to take better pictures of their kids or pets uh, or their travel photos, and that's great. 
Uh, and then there's probably some people that are doing this for real. They want to make money doing photography and they've invested heavily in gear. They're going to maybe make a career switch. Uh, but at the end of the day, this class is for the people that are here to have fun. We're starting with the beginners. Like if you just got your camera from a local store and you're unboxing it as you're watching this video, that's who I want to be teaching to. Long term, I'm going to lace in some of the more intermediate and advanced content, but I want to make sure people are starting from a very clear foundation of knowledge so that we can all be on the same page. The biggest thing I'm going to have to hold off on talking about probably is pricing. Like I love talking the business of photography, but if you can't take a decent picture, there's no way you can kind of sell that yet. So I'll have to patiently wait as will everybody else. But if you're here for fun, this is the right spot. Okay, so as for DSLR overview, so DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. Uh, this is a cross section of what one looks like if you chopped it. So. This is where we try the fun part of technology. And if you have a DSLR, you probably already know because it's in the name or on the receipt that you purchased. Uh, there's another type of camera that's been more popular in the last kind of three to five years, and those are micro four thirds cameras. Uh, the simple way to explain the difference between them is they just don't have that mirror box there because the light goes directly onto the camera sensor. The benefit of micro four thirds cameras is they're much smaller form factor, they're a lot lighter, so they can be great for days when you're doing really long shooting. I know a lot of wedding photographer friends of mine have moved over to micro four thirds just because like the drop in weight is much better, they can see a lot of preview elements on the back of their screens that you can't always get with a DSLR. Uh, I shoot with a DSLR and probably forever will. I like the feel of it, the weight, the size. I'm a bigger guy, so uh, I don't like having really tiny little tech in my hands. It makes me feel like I'm gonna break it. Uh, but those are the two you probably have if you're watching this video right now. Okay. All right, so now in terms of camera terminology, it's kind of this baseline of language uh, that's important for everybody to have because when we talk about photography, it can be like speaking a different language. Uh, and there's tons of resources online that even like this class, if you Google how to do this with a camera, there's going to be all these explanations that just require understanding what all these words and uh, terms actually mean. So first is the big one is the aperture inside our camera. So this is the diaphragm that actually changes how much or how little light is allowed onto the camera sensor. Uh, you probably have a dial or a switch on my camera. It's on the back here and I also have a dial on the top. Uh, that's what changes the aperture f-stop on our cameras. Uh, if you don't have two dials on your camera, you paid uh, maybe between like four to six hundred dollars for it, you might have a button like this plus and minus screen that's on this plus and minus image that's on the screen right now. If you hold that down and pull the dial left or right, that's what's gonna change your aperture. They do that just to kind of save on money and parts when they build and manufacture things. So that's how you're able to change that. Uh, depth of field is a result of changing that aperture. So depending on how big or small that hole is, that's it's gonna depend on how much of that scene is gonna be in focus. The smaller the hole is, the bigger the depth of field is. So if we're not letting in a lot of light, it's going through a really tiny hole, you'll be able to see all the way from yourself over to the mountains well far away from you. Whereas if we have a really big opening, that's great for portrait photography where just the single model's in sharp focus and then everything else behind them is blurry. Uh, exposure. So this is one of the most important elements you can do to change and improve your photography is getting the correct exposure. So the exposure is going to be the result of how big our aperture is, how long our shutter speed is, and then also the sensitivity of our ISO. So good exposure and bad exposure can be a little subjective to some, but exposure is the result of all those elements letting a certain amount of light onto the camera sensor and the resulting photos. You can see here there are some overexposed images, some underexposed images, and then normal, what we actually see with our human eye. Uh, so since exposure can be a little subjective, the best way to kind of study and kind of self-check yourself for exposure is using the histogram on the back of your camera. This is some setting that I would recommend everybody turning on because every LCD on the back of a camera is designed to make things look good. It's backlit, it's really saturated, it looks like images really pop off the page, but the histogram is a very objective measure of all the tones in the photograph and seeing where they all lie. So on the left of the histogram is all the blacks or dark tones and on the right side of the histogram are all the whites or bright tones. So you can see the example there of the Nikon camera. It's black and there's some like dark gray metal. There are some highlights, but a majority of that data is gonna to be to the left hand side. 
With a histogram, we're not looking for a specific shape or tonality or curve or anything like that. We just look at the camera and say like, this is black and dark. We likely see a lot of data to the left hand side. Uh, a well exposed photo in the center there, we've got the sky with detail on the blue and also the green trees and dark shadows there. So the information is kind of speckled across the whole histogram. There's some dark shadows, there's some bright highlights, and all of it fits within those field goal posts of the histogram. If we expose an image too much and we kind of lose detail in some areas, you'll see on that right hand example, it gets pushed over the side and it starts to blow out and bloom and just kind of looks like Frosty the Snowman in the sky. That's where we've lost detail. So there's no way to kind of recover and get that back. There are definitely arguments for making that happen, like in the photo of the triathlete that I showed a little earlier in this presentation. Sometimes we do want to overexpose things and it makes sense. But the best thing to measure by is looking at the histogram rather than the image on the back of your camera. So you have to cycle through and check your manual a little bit to see how to turn that setting on for your particular camera. ISO. So this is one of those elements that helps us control exposure and this is the sensitivity of the camera sensor. Uh, back in the day of film cameras you used to see all those photographers with like six or seven cameras wrapped over their neck. Uh, that was because every single camera, likely one, had a different lens on it for different focal length and zoom and also it had different sensitivity of film in it. So when they walked like inside the dark wedding venue and then went outside in the bright sunny daylight, they didn't have to adjust and like pull the film out because once you did that, you kind of ruined everything you just shot. Nowadays with digital, it's really cool because we can control ISO shot to shot and change that sensitivity uh, based on the circumstances we find ourselves in. So this is kind of a really stretched example of ISO, but the lower your ISO is, the higher quality image you're going to get. So ISO 100, you can see there's really smooth gradation through the whole sky there. And then once we move over up to ISO 3200 on admittedly a very old camera, we're going to see that kind of speckling effect if you went to like the wrong channel on an old TV. Uh, what's happening is as we increase the sensitivity, we're increasing the electricity that's pumped through the sensor. And with that, there's a loss of signal and quality. So you see that start to have that speckling effect. Uh, film photographers might look at this and say like, oh, that looks like old school grain for like high ISO film and grain and ISO are separate, uh, different things, but we'll leave that conversation for another day. Uh, at the end of the day, the important thing to realize is we want to have as high quality of photos we can possibly accomplish. So perhaps the person on the left that shot the ISO 100 photo had a tripod so they could have a really long exposure time to get those really nice smooth tones and use a lower sensitivity ISO. Whereas the person on the right, maybe they forgot their tripod at home and they had to sh shoot it handheld. So they needed a faster shutter speed. So they needed to make it even more sensitive to the light that was hitting it to match the same exposure in both photo. Again, there's a use case for every single situation where you can take a high ISO or low ISO setting, but you really want to understand that you're impacting the quality of the image. Sometimes you just have to shoot at ISO 3200 and that's okay. When I first left school, I was like ISO 100 or die because that's kind of what the teachers pounded into my head. Uh, but as I started shooting more and more, I got more comfortable using the full spectrum of ISO that my camera had available. Uh, that's typically what people pay for nowadays is the ISO range, so really do not be afraid to take advantage of it. All right, JPEGs. So JPEG is the most common kind of compression file type for shooting images off your camera. You can send a JPEG to your mom, grandma, they can open it over email and it works really well. Uh, the other is a raw file. Raw files are great because they have a lot of data inside them, but they're quite big and they need to be processed. So when you're starting off, if you're not shooting anything crazy amazing and don't want to kind of invest down the software path, I would just recommend shooting JPEGs. They take up less room on the card, you can shoot more photographs, and it's just practice anyways. So just like when you're writing, you bought those kind of like Hillary notebooks from Zellers back in the day. Uh, we can save ourselves for the raw files that are the really nice kind of moleskin notebooks further down the road. Uh, megapixels used to be a huge consideration when buying cameras. So megapixels refers to the size of the sensor. And the funny thing about megapixels is every camera company gets to determine how they measure megapixels. So imagine car manufacturers said like miles per gallon, but my mile is this long and the other person's mile is that long. Uh, it's become a little bit of a misnomer. It is a helpful reference if you know and understand how they're making those equations work. 
Uh, the biggest concern with megapixels back in the day when digital came into being was, is it large enough to kind of print an 8x10 or a 16x20? Uh, now we can get huge files just off our iPhones, and this is no longer a worry if you still haven't potentially bought a camera, and you're kind of like shopping around from megapixels to megapixels. If it's between two brands, and this one has 20 and this one has 18, you're not really comparing apples to apples. But know that each of them is going to be more than enough to be able to post anything online and also get prints likely up to at least 16 by 20 and larger depending on how much you need to stretch and what the composition and matter is. Uh, so we touched on noise before but I just want to make sure it's really clear. Uh, noise is a result of extra electricity being pumped through that sensor and causing that loss of quality. Uh, the problem with noise that makes it so tough to remove in Photoshop is it's not uniform throughout the image. So you can see if you zoom in a little bit there that there are kind of like red and green speckles. So there's color changes as well as quality changes. So to go in and actually pull those out, there are some great pieces of software, but it does make it more difficult. So we want to make sure we're picking the right ISO for the situation. There's no reason you should be out in a bright sunny day in like middle of summer shooting ISO 3200. We want to take advantage of all that light and reduce our ISO because we don't need all that sensitivity that we would if we were out at like midnight in December uh, shooting Santa Claus on our roof. Uh, so if you zoom in a lot to your actual camera sensor, you're going to see all these little pixels that are done in this kind of crosshatch pattern. Uh, you can get really technical in that, but basically each one of those pixels captures two greens, one blue, and one red, and that's what makes up the color in our images. So if you had a microscope, this is what you actually see on the sensor itself, and that's how we capture light. Uh, this is an example of kind of like what needs to happen to a raw file. So initially when you shoot a raw file, they're quite flat. They need to be processed to really pull out all that detail and dynamic range that they have in them. The one on the right is pushed pretty extensively just to kind of like showcase what kind of range you can get out of a single file. But people initially start shooting raw and they're like so mad that it doesn't look as good as their JPEGs because it still needs a little help in post-production. Whether that be Lightroom, Photoshop, all the other different softwares out there, raw files do need to be manipulated so people can also look at them on their computer. If you don't have Photoshop or Lightroom, you can't actually open and look at a raw file effectively, so we need to export out a JPEG or a PSD or a TIFF file or something like that so people can open them on their own home computers without needing that software. Resolution. So this attaches a little bit to our megapixel conversation. Uh, you can choose the quality on your camera of how big of a resolution file you're going to need. Uh, this might come important into play if you're going on a really big trip and you want to cram as many images on your card as possible. You can downgrade the resolution size of each file that you're going to make so you can put more images on the same card. So. You might do some kind of like happy fun street photographs that don't matter as much to you and you just want kind of like a record of what you were on that day. And then at the end of the day, you're maybe gonna capture this beautiful sunset picture. So you wanna increase the resolution you're capturing. So when you get home, you have more file to kind of work with and also change for whatever your kind of printing needs or if you're gonna post it online or do one of those kind of online eBooks that you can get printed out and make a calendar for yourself. So the great thing about that is we have all that flexibility in a digital camera on a shot to shot basis. Uh, shutter speed. So this is how long the shutter curtains expose the actual camera sensor to light. Uh, for every medium that you shoot, you're going to need a different speed to freeze it. Uh, I've shot a lot of ultimate frisbee in my day, and I know if I shoot to one one thousandth or one two thousandth of a second, that's fast enough to freeze those players. Uh, whereas if I'm shooting cars going down the street and I want to have that cool streaking effect at night, I probably want anywhere from kind of 10 to 20 seconds. So shutter speed is all a kind of matter of creative preference, but it's also taking into account the subject matter that you're photographing. Uh, as a rule of thumb, probably around 1 60th of a second is where you want to lie for a lot of kind of handheld shooting with a basic lens. Uh, that'll help make sure that you're not shaking your hands or that's not taking into account and creating a little bit of blur in your images. Uh, SD memory cards. So this is what is going to help you store all those images. They've gotten so cheap. When I first got into photography, I bought like an 8 gigabyte card for $200. And nowadays there's like 10x, 20x that size for a quarter of the rate. So having a couple of these is really helpful. Uh, if you're just beginning shooting, I would recommend at least two of these just in case you run out of space. You're, if you don't have something to shoot on, you basically have a big dead paperweight. 
Uh, I typically keep my cards between 32 to 64 gigabytes. Uh, I don't like having really big cards that are kind of 128 like in this example, because if something goes wrong with that card, all those images are toast. And when I do this for a living, it's really important that I have that kind of segregation and backup of, hey, this is all the shots from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and this is all the shots from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. If something goes wrong, it's only a certain section of the images and not the entire wedding day, for example. So somewhere around 32 to 64 gigabytes is a good range to kind of aim for for purchasing SD cards. Uh, and this, of course, is very dependent on how much and frequently you shoot and how important that backup element is for you. Uh, white balance on your camera. So our eyes are amazing tools. And as you get into photography, you realize how much better our eyes are than cameras. So the biggest thing we compensate for that you don't even notice as a human is white balance. We can walk into any room and we automatically neutralize the tones of light coming at us. Our camera has an auto white balance function. We'll talk about why that's a terrible idea later on. Uh, but we need to kind of pick and tell the camera what light source is actually hitting our subject. Uh, there is definitely a subjective element to all things in photography and creativity, but there is a very technical approach we can take to this. On the left-hand photo here, we've got the really nice kind of like warmer tone to the street vendor here, and that could be a great for a kind of street magazine editorial about what it's like to feel to be at a night market. Uh, whereas if you're the person selling the smocks and you're on the right-hand side, you can actually see it's a white smock. It actually represents correctly. So depending on what the final use of the photo is, really hinges how important the correct white balance is for a photograph. Typically, we always want to start with the best white balance for the scene, the best slash correct one, and then we can always kind of yank it around afterwards in post-production if we need to, but it's always great to start with a really technically sound file in the beginning. Okay, so that's all the camera terminology done. Let's get on to my quick little kind of camera walkthrough here. Uh, so this is a camera I purchased recently. It's a Canon 6D Mark II. Uh, I'm just going to use this as an example to kind of walk through a camera and all the settings I'm kind of aware of and the parts and pieces because maybe it's the first time you're unboxing yours. Every camera is going to be a little different. Canon, Nikon, Sony, Lumix, they all have a little bit of a different approach to ergonomics and where they place buttons. So if you have a specific camera that isn't Canon, you might want to check out other tutorials, but this will help you kind of get a baseline of where all these things are, what you need to watch for. Uh, so on this Canon 6D here is my 24 to 70 millimeter lens, which has a lens hood on it. So this lens hood comes off, you just kind of twist it out, uh, and then it gets connected to the front here. What this helps with is kind of light coming in from different angles and causing flare, just like in kind of Edgar's photograph, where there's that backlit and that big bloom of lights. Uh, some people, I see a lot of beginners kind of just leave these on the camera and point it backwards. And if it's just doing this, it's kind of just in your way and not helping you uh, get through this. Uh, we're also going to change this to an exciting new scene here so you can see me and I'm bigger. Uh, so as you can see, this is keeping me from all the controls and that isn't that helpful. So if you do have this on, you can slide it off and get it out of the way. If you put it on correctly, just make sure there is a right orientation for each uh, because you want it to match up with the kind of rectangle you're composing your photograph on. Once you kind of see there's two dots to help line it up and that'll help you orient in the right way. But for now, I'm going to put this down and out of the way. Uh, so on the lens itself, we have two rings here. Uh, one of which is going to be the focusing ring and one of which is going to be the zoom ring. On cameras, sometimes they switch these back and forth. Sometimes the zoom ring's in front and the focusing ring is behind, but you'll have to check for yours. What you need to know is when you do the zoom ring, that's actually going to cause the elements of the camera to move, which is going to cause that zoom. Uh, on the left-hand side here, I have an AF and MF button. So that stands for autofocus and manual focus. This controls whether the camera is going to do the heavy lifting of making things sharp in the scene, or I'm actually going to have to do the heavy lifting in the scene. Uh, over to the left here, I'm going to take a quick disclaimer and say, don't do this yet. Watch first and then do. Uh, this is the camera lens release button. So I know a lot of people kind of get a camera and the lens is already attached or they just get it borrowed to them. If you're ever switching lenses out, this is the important like really expensive button if things go wrong. Uh, so if you do want to switch lenses and take things off, you just depress this lens release button and then you twist the lens off. For some manufacturers, it's going to be clockwise. For others, it's going to be counterclockwise. So you never need to use more than finger pressure to get camera pieces apart. If you need to like ask your CrossFit going friend to help you, you're probably doing something wrong. 
Uh, so when we put this back together, you can see on my camera, there's a red dot at the top of that and also a red dot at the top of this lens. When I put these two pieces back together, I just need to make sure they're aligned perfectly. And again, just super gentle, being really nice and slow. I'm gonna be really quiet and hold this up to the microphone so you can hear the very audible click. Once it's clicked in, you can see I can't twist it back out until I press this lens release button again. So again, if you ever need to change lenses, that's how it works for this camera. Okay, so now we go to the top of the camera for me. So on the left-hand side, I've got all the shooting mode dials here. So I can pick between manual mode, aperture priority, shutter speed priority program, and all the kind of fun typical settings you get on a camera like this. You might have like a sport mode or portrait or flower. Uh, at the end of the day, it's good to be a bit of a masochist in this and just go straight to shooting manual. It will be tougher, your images will get worse quickly in the beginning, but the long-term payoff of understanding what you're doing is totally worth it. So I leave my shooting mode dial on M for manual and that helps me have a lot more control over my exposure. Uh, over on the top of the camera here, we've got our hot shoe. So this is where you'll connect any flashes or transceivers for doing studio photography. Uh, it's probably the most bomb-proof part on the camera. It's like big, heavy, thunk metal. So if you've got an external flash, things like that, that's where it's going to get connected. Uh, on my camera here, on the right-hand side, I have a mode selector dial. And this helps me control whether the shutter speed or aperture or whatever the menu setting I'm navigating. And then I also have obviously the shutter button, which you've all probably pressed at least once in your life. Uh, for most cameras, this is gonna be a two-stage button. So once you press down halfway on the shutter button, it's probably gonna autofocus, it's gonna measure the exposure for you, and once you press all the way down, then it's actually gonna take the photograph for you. So nice to know that it is a two-stage button. Uh, up on the top here, I've got my autofocus, drive, ISO, metering, and also backlit button. Again, these are gonna be different camera to camera, but this just allows quicker accessibility. So when I'm shooting and actually have the camera to my face, that I don't have to navigate all the way through the menu while something's happening in front of me. Once you get to know your camera enough, you'll be able to do this kind of subconsciously, just like you can probably, but you shouldn't answer a text while you're driving your car or like eating a snack while you're kind of like shifting your gears over on the right. It becomes a little subconscious because we get very used to it just as much as you're behind the camera, you know what all these buttons do and open those menus without even looking. Uh, so that's the lens and the top of the camera. Uh, let's go over here to the side. So for me, I've got my SD card slot in here. It just slides out and pops. For most SD cards, they're put in by pressure and they're kind of spring loaded. So if I just press down on this, better angle for that, this pops out and then I can pull out this SD card. So I've got 128 gig in here. And you just want to make sure the orientation when you put it in is right. With anything with cameras, there's a right way and a wrong way to put things in. So if you need any more than kind of like light finger pressure, that's probably a good little measure that you've got this pointed the wrong direction. So I'm just going to slide that in there and it's all happy. Okay. Uh, so now onto the back of the camera here. So on this particular camera, I've got a rotatable LCD screen, which is great for kind of making different compositions and kind of hiding the screen if I need to kind of protect it. I know I'm going to be banging it around a little bit more. I can flip around and get it out of the way. Uh, also can be really helpful if you're at a funny angle and can't really get behind the camera and want to check your composition when it's on a tripod. It can be really helpful to have something that flips around like this, but by no means a necessity. Uh, a whole bunch of option buttons here between shooting to live view, autofocus on, my custom buttons, and also autofocus points. Uh, most important on the back of this is gonna be my dial and selector button. So if you've played any kind of video games ever, even Tetris, that counts too. Hi, mom. Um, you can change this around to select different areas of the menu and navigate through that. So on my particular camera, there's a spinning dial here, and there's also a little joystick with an OK button in the center. So that's what helps me actually navigate through all the menus on my camera, okay? Uh, up at the top corner here, we've got a menu and an info button. For Canon, info is what's gonna get me to that histogram I talked about a little earlier, and the menu is obviously gonna get me to the menu structure to see all those images on the back of the camera. Okay. Uh, last but not least, the bottom here. So at the bottom, we've got a little input here for attaching your camera to a tripod. Some tripods will just have a threaded top to them you can spin it into, some you'll have a tripod plate. I do have a video about what tripods to buy on my channel, so if you wanna go check that out, you're more than welcome to. I explain that a little more in depth there. Uh, last but not least, we've got our kind of battery compartment here where this battery pops out. Uh, as you can see on the side of the battery, it's got different tongue and grooves in it, so it does go in a particular way. It also has these kind of metal studs at the end you know you're actually putting this in the correct direction. So again, 
anything more than finger pressure. I've put it in the right here, way here, so it's not gonna screw with me, but if I try and go in the opposite way, it's actually not even gonna let me because the tongue and grooves aren't aligned correctly. So it's kind of a nice thing the manufacturers did to make sure people don't make mistakes. Again, super easy, single finger pressure, pushing down on this. And now we're all good to go. Uh, everybody has different cameras, so since you, I know one, I know Canon and Nikon, probably the best of all of them. Uh, if anybody has any questions about their particular brand, please do put them in the comments below. Uh, cameras are a little bit like languages. There's adjacent languages where you kind of understand German, you know a little bit of French. If you know a little bit of French, you know a little bit of Spanish kind of thing. So I can figure out things on Canon and Nikon super quickly. Uh, Sony, Sony Lumix, and the other brands, it takes me a little bit of a second, but they all speak similarly to each other. They all have to have a shutter button in a certain place. They all have to have exposure controls in another place. So it just takes a little bit of time. But if you're stuck on anything, please do ask. I love figuring stuff like this out. I'm a little bit of an insatiable fixer. Uh, so please do let me know if you're stuck anywhere. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna slide through to the next batch of things we're gonna talk about here. Okay. So one thing I can't do really well through this camera here is show you what's going on inside the camera when you look through it. So this is our viewfinder with a whole bunch of things turned on. If all these things are turned on your camera, something is probably going horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, but this is just to illustrate all the things that show information from what you're shooting and the settings of that, the exposure, how many images are left. Uh, so every camera is going to be a little bit different, but majority, all of them rather, are going to have your shutter speed, your aperture, likely your ISO, an exposure meter, and then probably how many frames are left that you can shoot onto that card before it's full, or how many frames you can shoot until the buffer on the camera is full. Like if you're shooting sports and things like that, you might shoot anywhere from like 10 to 20 photos until it says, oh, no, I'm full. I need to write that all to the SD card and then kind of go from there. The diopter, good. Okay, I leave this in there because it's the most commonly misset thing on the camera. So as you can see here, I've got one on the back. Remember, bro, as I get closer to the screen here. For Canons, it's a little dial set up at the top right-hand corner. What this allows for is people that wear glasses to control how much or how little of a change there is to the prescription, like the focus of the camera when you're looking through the lens. So if you wear glasses and you want to keep wearing glasses when you look through the camera, this is great. If you want to take your glasses off but have a prescription, this allows you to look through the camera and still dial in that 2080 or whatever kind of composition your lens prescription is. Uh, it's the most common mistake that gets made for beginners when they purchase a camera because what happens is they look at that camera and they can't get sharp images because this diopter is set incorrectly. So everything they're looking at is out of focus when it actually is in focus or vice versa. So the first thing I typically do when I pick up a camera is I make sure I've set this diopter correctly. Uh, how you set this correctly is you just pick up the camera, turn it on, and then if you just half press your shutter button, you'll see the images at the bottom of the screen through the viewfinder here pop up. For me, they're green numbers. And all I want to do is change that diopter until those numbers are as sharp as possible. That's how I know I've got it set correctly for my eye, uh, because that's a really safe objective measure of setting that up. Okay. Uh, also at the bottom of your camera meter is going to be camera viewfinder is going to be your exposure meter. So it's going to go from anywhere from probably negative two to plus two. Uh, but just know that when you're changing exposure and that meter's moving from left to right, it's actually not a linear scale. We'll get into exposure a later, little later on in this series, uh, but just know that you're not going one, two, three, four, five, six with the exposure meter. You're actually going one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. It is an exponential scale. Things get bright really quickly and they get dark also very quickly. So it gives us a lot of control over how we change our images when we're photographing them. Uh, as you're looking through the viewfinder, you'll also have the ability to control all the individual focus points. So when we talked about the lens having that autofocus manual focus slider, this is what allows you to kind of tell the camera, hey, these are the points I want you to look at. Uh, for any camera, you kind of want it set to single point autofocus because right now on this picture on the screen, all the points are looking for an element of sharp focus and you're giving the control over to the camera and it could pick, maybe it's the model, maybe it's the road behind them, maybe it's the street lamp at the top, 
we want to be very concise and maintain all that control about having this element of the photograph being in sharp focus and everything the depth of field builds from there. Uh, every back of camera is going to look a little different in terms of menus. So when you turn on that LCD viewfinder, this is what you might see on the back of a Canon camera. So at the top left, you'll see M, which stands for manual shooting mode. One one thousandth of a second is the shutter speed. F 1.8 is the aperture and ISO 100 is the ISO. Uh, the rest of it is all additional information that is kind of in the intermediate and advanced settings that we'll talk about in the future. But those are the big three you need to be aware of because that's what's going to be controlling that exposure meter just under that big M on this screen. If we can manipulate shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, you're already well and ahead of the game. Uh, so if we take that and we look at a Nikon camera again, we talked about that adjacent language thing, pretty similar. So right now that big A stands for auto mode, one half is one half of a second, uh, f3.5 is the aperture, and they've got their exposure meter underneath that set. You can see ISO is a little lower down, ISO 100 for this current setting. So again, once you kind of get familiar with what you're looking for, you can kind of pull it away from every little readout and get it to do the thing that you're looking for, for your final result for your images. Uh, since I'm not going to slice one of my lenses in half, this is what the typical lens looks like with all those elements of glass to help us zoom in and out. Uh, back in the day, we just had, oh, you know what? This is the great thing about shooting itself at home. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, we just had single or prime lenses. So this is just a 50 millimeter lens. This doesn't zoom. It's a, sing a couple elements of glass rather than a zoom lens, which will be multiple elements to allow us that flexibility of zooming in and out. You can see when I pull the zoom ring here, it actually changes the distance of all these elements. Not dissimilar if you ever used a microscope in biology class in high school. Uh, it's changing how much zoom and also those, re those elements in relation to each other. So there isn't any change in color to the image. There isn't some excessive distortion to your subject. All those good things. Okay, so just coming to the end here, we're gonna wrap up with a little piece of homework to take away before next week. Uh, so first thing, if you've got a camera and you're trying to get into photography for the first time, I'm sorry for the bad news, but read your camera manual. Uh, go through it front to back. I know it's not the most exciting reading, but there are so many specific things your camera does that you might not know about, and also your friends that even bought the same brand might not know about, or even your camera club. So this is the single biggest thing you can help to be better at photography, is understanding all the tools you have available within your menus, within your camera. You don't need to memorize it. There's not going to be a quiz, but I guarantee you down the road when somebody mentions, oh, my camera does so-and-so, you'll have this little click in your head to be like, oh, I read that somewhere in my camera. Now it's important time to go back and look at my manual and figure out how to do that because now it's relevant. Uh, I have a lot of people come into my class and they just, how do I get better at photography? And they don't know how to use the tool in front of them. Understanding what that tool can do is one of the most important pieces of that. Uh, I'm not kidding. Please do read it. Uh, it answers so many questions. I can do my best to try and address anything that comes up for you. Absolutely, I will do my best. But you knowing your tool is very much just like entrepreneurship and freelancing is photography. We're all a little bit on our own to a degree. So making sure that we really understand this kind of like $500 to $5,000 investment we've just made makes sense and we know how to use it is really, really important. Uh, now, off from the drier side of the homework, uh, once you've kind of read through that manual and kind of played with the settings a little bit, I'd like you to go try and take a self-portrait. Uh, what that'll cause you to need to do is one, to play around with exposure a little bit, and also understand how to do self-timer mode on the camera, which are two really important places to play with, especially if you're pursuing this online and without any support of like, college resources or facilities and things like that. If you can do exposure and self-timer, you're putting yourself in a really good place. Uh, it does not have to be a great self-portrait. I've got some examples here of what I did for my setup. So as you can see, I shot this in this very studio. Uh, I just had my camera rigged up with a couple of washcloths to get an angle. I didn't even use a tripod. I'm allegedly a professional. So I set my camera up in this angle, played with the exposure a little bit until I was happy, adjusted the shutter speed, ISO, uh, and then finally, this is what I came up with. Uh, I wanted to show a little bit of myself outside of teaching and photography. Uh, if I'm not doing either of those things, I'm usually hanging out with all the uh, 
like COVID group I met online. We just yell at people over video games, which is a nice release for anybody after a big long work day. So this is what I came out with. It took me a couple times to kind of get the reaction and the facial expression I was looking for, the nice little blur of the hand there to show that I was very upset with what happened, which is what happens more often than not for me when I'm playing. Uh, but just kind of make it something fun and make it your own. Make it something about your personality, a hobby, a personality trait. Uh, it's a very open-ended assignment. The more important thing is to get you to take it yourself with your own camera and figure out that self-timer and exposure for yourself. Uh, once you've done that, you'll probably have some really good questions coming up to next week and be in a much better place understanding where your camera's at. Uh, so this is where we come down to the other section of questions, and I see at least there is a viewer here, which is awesome. So I'm going to pull open the chat, and if there's any questions, that's great. If there's not, we'll kind of wrap it up for the evening, and I will see everybody the next time I stream. Uh, if there isn't any questions, I'll answer the one that most commonly gets asked of me of like, what camera should I get? And this is where doing this live on the internet is always scary because you know someone's going to be unhappy with what you said. Uh, in my experience as an instructor, I would recommend going with either Nikon or Canon. Uh, the reason why that is is because there's so many support articles out for those two major brands because they've been around the longest. Uh, I have some students come in with like a Sony or a Lumix camera and there's some really specific hiccups in terms of how the camera acts and treats exposure and also working in studios uh, that just becomes a little bit of a barrier for the student. They still make great cameras, arguably some of the sensors are better than Canon and Nikon when you're comparing apples to apples. But I find if you're really stuck and there's just way too many choices now, when I bought my first camera, there were only like three brands making digital cameras. And now there's, you know, tons out there and it becomes, you walk into a camera store, like, how do I even begin to pick? You've got your budget, you've got how it feels in your hands, all these things. It can be really, really difficult. So I think it helps to kind of narrow your choices down to Canon or Nikon and then kind of go from there. Uh, in terms of your budget, I would recommend not buying the best camera from the beginning because you're going to need to replace your camera eventually. Uh, I would recommend kind of splitting your budget between uh, a good-ish camera and also a really nice lens, like a 50mm 1.8. Uh, I think that's hands down the best investment a photographer can make early on. And lenses are going to last pff, as long as you treat them really well. I've still got original lenses that I bought back in 2000 five because I'm super meticulous with my gear uh, but the cameras that I use with them are well dust mothballed and on the shelf because cameras digital cameras especially retire they have a life shel shelf life wow getting to the end of the stream here folks can you tell uh, they have a shelf life of anywhere kind of like three to ten years depending on how nice or big you bought and then it goes by the wayside because there's new sensors, there's new technologies, there's new connections to computers, there's new software that can do cooler things with the newer cameras, so people inevitably upgrade. But the one thing that does stick around is lenses. So if you have a thousand dollar budget, I would recommend spending, you know, 500 to 700 on a camera and then the remainder on a lens rather than spending the full thousand on a single camera because you're gonna need to upgrade in the future and you can use that money in better places, in my opinion. All right. So that's everything for tonight. Thank you everybody for who watched the stream live or is watching it right now from the comfort of your own couch in whatever time of day it is. And I look forward to doing this. I feel like I'm going to have to get some buttons that play a laugh track so it doesn't feel as quite as isolated here in the studio. So I look forward to teach you all next time. And please do comment, send me questions. I'm on Instagram. All the links are below. Uh, and maybe potentially if there's enough, I might do kind of like a frequently asked question Friday thing. But we'll see how many questions I get. Anyhow, have a great night. Thanks for your attention.